Okay, hi there, welcome to uh, the first in a couple of videos looking at the highly topical issue of the UK energy price crisis. Uh, I'm recording this in February 2022. I think this could well be a, a likely sort of exam topic either this year or next year. It's so topical, it's so important to have an understanding of the, of the energy price market. Uh, what we're seeing is, is a huge rise in fuel bills, huge rise in fuel bills caused by an increase in the world's price of gas, and that is likely and will cause, in fact, a sharp increase in fuel poverty and force, well, millions of households in the UK into making uh, very tough cho choices about how to spend their limited budget. This is going to be one of the biggest issues of the age. Here are two headlines from uh, the end of last week. Uh, Britain's, according to the Bank of England, facing the biggest drop in their real living standards as measured by real disposable incomes. The Bank of England governor... Uh, Bailey, Governor Bailey, uh, hinting, uh, for which he's got a lot of criticism, by the way, uh, that people should resist asking for inflation-protecting pay rises this year. Uh, presumably, he's on nearly £500,000 a year, so he doesn't really need a big, a big uh, rise in pay. Others might be in a different situation. So in this video, uh, I'm going to look in at the background to the UK gas supply industry. Hopefully this will be useful context for you. And in the second video, we'll focus on government policy, what governments can do to try to mitigate what's happening in both the global and the UK energy market. First question, what, what market structure best describes the UK gas supply industry? Well, interestingly, this is the market share uh, in December of 2020 of the leading suppliers, British Gas is the biggest there in blue, the biggest supplier of natural gas. Uh, at the end of 2020, it had a market share of nearly 27%. The big six companies, including E.ON e e and EDF and things and Scottish Power, the big six companies uh, traditionally have had well more than 70% of the market. That has changed. Uh, the three firm concentration ratio is the, the combined market share of the, of the leading three firms in the market. And if you do the maths, that came to 51.6% at the end of 2020. The five firm concentration ratio, you may well have come across this if you've studied oligopoly. Uh, it needs to be 60% for this to be an oligopoly. And indeed, if you do the maths, if you add another 16.2% on, uh, then if you're adding in the EDF and uh, Scottish Power, you end up with 67.8%. Now, crucially, the market share of the big firms until recently has been coming down uh, because um, of the emergence, the arrival of lots of new firms into the market. But that is now at risk. That's now changing. So 67.7 there. 67.8%, sorry. Now, let's think about what factors make up the typical gas bill. So when a household receives their gas bill, uh, whatever that level is, it's clearly going up. Uh, this chart shows the breakdown of a gas bill uh, by component. And you can see that wholesale costs, the cost to the energy supply businesses um, uh, when they go buy gas in the market, that accounts for 41%, just over 41% of the cost of a bill. Then there are network costs, costs of transmitting the energy, the gas, the electricity and things uh, to households and businesses. Other operating costs, including things like clearly wages and pensions, a VAT, and also some climate change obligations and other direct costs. So two thirds of the cost of a gas bill for you as a household is basically made up by the wholesale price and by network costs. I've mentioned the wholesale price. So what is the wholesale market for gas? Well, this is where uh, there is a wholesale market. Um, so I think companies like Scottish uh, National Power and things, they are the energy generators. They generate the gas or the gas becomes available. Uh, there is a wholesale market for electricity and gas that's purchased in bulk by energy companies to resell for profit. So energy suppliers like Ovo or uh, what have you, they buy wholesale energy from energy producers they then add their charges to cover the cost of distribution of energy to households and businesses, including things like metering and uh, maintaining um, uh, safety of, of boilers and things. And this, so they then operate at the retail level for gas. So the retail market for gas is the final mile service that supplies and meters gas usage, gas usage including smart meters, 
by millions of households and businesses. Now, the retail gas market has been changing uh, over, over, the, over the period. Ofgem, that's the industry regulator, uh, they deregulated the retail market for energy. They were basically trying to encourage and allow smaller energy firms, independent firms, to trade. Um, and the aim was to stimulate competition and to reduce the dominance of the big six gas supply businesses. So many suppliers entered the market. I think sometime about two years ago, there was something like 75 million, maybe nearly 90 gas suppliers operating in the UK. But the big story is that number has come down dramatically in the last 12 to 18 months. I think something like 25, perhaps even 30 businesses either went bust and or left the market in 2021. Uh, the impact of the price cap has forced many entrants out. I'll explain that to you in this video. And is now, in fact, reinforcing the market dominance of the big established companies, perhaps an example of government failure to deregulate the market. Now, again, so thinking about the UK, is the UK economy a net exporter or a net importer of gas? And the answer is... Uh, that uh, despite a few years in the late 1990s and around the turn of the millennium, the UK is a net importer of gas. You see, North Sea gas production probably peaked the best part of 20, 25 years ago. And so whilst at the turn of the millennium, we were able to produce more than enough gas to meet demand, and therefore we were able to become a net exporter, you can see from this chart that demand has fallen I mean, energy efficiency, for example, has increased and there's been a shift to renewables. But gas production's fallen even further. So the gap between demand and production is met by imports. So the gas imports have gone up. And I think gas imports now account for something like 40% of total gas demand. Indeed, something, you know, something like 20 million households are reliant on gas. So where does our gas come from? Well, Norway actually accounted for um, something like 55% of UK gas imports in 2020. This is just natural gas. I haven't included liquefied natural gas in this chart. Um, about 42% arrived as liquefied natural gas. I think about half of that is from Qatar, uh, Russia, United States and things. So most of our natural gas comes from Norway. Uh, there are also pipelines from Belgium and uh, from the Netherlands and Denmark. Uh, of course, this is all part of the shift in primary fuel production. So look at the, this table, look at the million tonnes of oil equivalent production of natural gas peaking in around 2020, uh, 20, 2000. And then obviously now there's now a shadow of its form itself down by about two thirds. And look at coal production peaking in 1990 uh, and is now an absolute shadow. Of, of production. On the supply side, therefore, the UK is a net importer of gas, um, but obviously there's a demand for gas. There's a, there's a demand for natural gas in the UK. This chart just picks this up. It, it adds together the demand from industry, uh, domestic supply, domestic demand. So that's in red. That's things like households who use gas to heat their homes and uh, make meals and things. Services, lots of restaurants and things and hotels use gas. Energy industry, gas, uh, uh, gas-fired power stations, uh, electricity generation, etc. So quite a substantial demand for gas. It has ebb and flowed. It's come down in the long term, but there are some short-term and long-term factors that impact on the demand for gas. In the short term, things like the severity of the winter weather uh, and the strength of growth. So when you have a very, very cold winter, obviously household demand for energy goes up. Energy demand for energy to heat offices and shops and schools goes up and that can increase demand for gas. So too, the strength of growth. The gas is a good example of derived demand. So when the economy is doing well, rebounding quickly from a recession, for example, then industries are increasing production and therefore they may well be using more gas. There's a cyclical demand, if you like. In the long term, however, it's, demand is driven more by changes in energy efficiency. So if we can get our loft insulation and our cavity wall insulation right in millions of homes, if we can find more energy efficient uh, uh, heating systems and uh, appliances, then we can use less gas. And it's also driven by the long term path of commodities. So, for example, if renewables become cheaper relatively over time, people might shift their 
gas, the, the energy supply towards renewables or nuclear power. So the key question uh, in this first video is what has been happening to the world wholesale price of gas? The market, don't forget this is the market where energy suppliers go and buy their gas for to delivery to households. Well, this chart shows the monthly price for natural gas in the United States in blue and Europe in orange. Now, the United States has had a much more stable path for gas prices. They have been going up, but nowhere near to the extent that they have in, in Europe, which, of course, has seen a huge rise in the price of gas. And uh, you know, thinking about what factors can affect this, why have global gas prices risen so sharply? Well, here are four. Some of it is COVID-related. So the, the, there was a big fall in gas demand during the pandemic, during lockdown, obviously, during shutdown, but that has now rebounded quickly. And so in the UK, for example, demand for gas has gone up, but we have limited gas storage capacity. So that you've got rising demand against limited supply. Uh, wind turbines in 2021 have not supplied as much energy as expected. So power generators have had to shift back towards gas. Uh, the UK housing stock is energy inefficient. So... It's becoming more and more apparent that we're using a lot of gas simply to maintain our temperatures, but we're losing a lot of energy. And if you're following politics, of course, if, you, if you're into your geopolitics, clearly big issues and geopolitical uh, issues in Ukraine, for example, uh, some evidence that Gazprom in Russia has been holding back some gas supplies from the system into the European gas market. So a combination of limited supply um, and, and growing demand is driving prices up. And here's the monthly average gas price uh, in the UK from 2015 to 2022. I think I've taken this all the way through to the end of 2021, sorry. Um, gas prices, this is based on day ahead baseload, baseload contracts. And uh, you can see that prices have sh has shifted up, risen dramatically since the start of 2021. Uh, there is actually a difference between the spot price of gas and the forward or futures price of gas. You see, to protect themselves from variations and volatility in price, an energy supply company like I don't know, Bulb Energy or Shell, they can hedge their gas buying. And that means that rather than buying gas all at once and being exposed to whatever the spot price is on a daily basis, suppliers can, can buy some energy perhaps months, years in advance. And that means that suppliers are less exposed to market fluctuations and they can offer customers a good, good, often very attractive fixed deal because they've already bought the energy that those customers will eventually use. So hedging is a form of reducing risk. But of course, you've got to have the money to buy that gas now for delivery in the future, be it the summer of 2022 or perhaps the end of, the end of this year. We'll come back to that in a second. Now, crucial to the story, if you're following the gas market, is the energy price cap. The energy price cap, I thought, was, I think it was introduced in something like 2018, perhaps a few years ago, by Ofgem. Uh, basically, it, it limits or puts a cap on the, uh, the rate that the supplier of gas can charge for their default tariffs. And it's basically a cap on each kilowatt hour event of electricity and gas. So it doesn't actually cap your total bill. That depends how much energy you use, but it caps the price per kilowatt hour. And it's based on several factors, including the wholesale cost of power in the preceding six months. Now, this chart is from Ofgem, and it shows what the cap was when it was introduced, first of all, in the winter of 2018. It's always been pretty much above £1,000. Uh, it's periodically reviewed, I think, every six months. They may make it every three months in the future. Uh, the cap sets, sets a maximum price on a unit of energy, not the bill. The bill depends on how many people you have in the house, how much energy you use. But crucially, crucially, it was going up, already going up in the summer of 2021. And then it went up again for the winter we just had. It was up 12, uh, was it 1,277 pounds, I think. But on the 22nd of February, just a few days ago, the cap for 22 million people was increased by over 50% to just under £2,000 per year per household. So this is an absolutely huge increase in the energy price cap. It is going to affect millions of people, adding to the cost of living and putting people under great fuel stress. 
And allied to this is the, the related issue of why energy companies are going bust. Over the last 12 months, 29 energy companies have exited the UK gas market or they've put in special, been put in special administration. In the wake of, of the soaring gas price globally, something like four and a half, perhaps even five million domestic customers have been affected by the collapse of a local supplier. Here are just a few of them, up to and including the 18th of January. Some interesting names, Together Energy Retail, Zog Energy, Entice Energy, Orbit Energy, one of your social energy supply. And CNG, which was one of the big suppliers of energy to non-domestic customers, things like offices and things and hotels and things, based in Harrogate. So why are energy companies going bust? You might want to pause the video at this point and maybe jot down a couple of reasons if you've, if you've studied the market. What's, why is it that so many energy companies have gone bust? Well, typically they're very small businesses, so they haven't achieved those big economies of scale. What happened was that when they deregulated the market, many of these new entrants offered incredibly low teaser prices to new customers. And if you sign up, for this gas price deal, you're going to get a great deal on your gas supply. You can lock in and fix, uh, and that's with a way of gaining market share. Well, when wholesale gas prices were low, these companies could do that. They could buy their gas cheaply, uh, charge a low teaser price, and uh, make a profit. However, as we've seen from the chart a few seconds ago, the world, the European, the UK wholesale gas price surged, but... The regulator had maintained that cap. So the smaller companies were under a lot of trouble because they had to buy wholesale gas very expensively, but they couldn't raise their price because of the cap. Most of the smaller new entrants could not afford to hedge to reduce their risk of exposure. One or two could, but most, most couldn't. And customers of smaller suppliers are now paying less for gas than their suppliers are because of the cap, leading to losses. Lots of businesses have gone bust, one of which was Bulb. Bulb has actually been essentially nationalised. The Treasury is covering their running costs this winter. They had a, now one of the bigger new entrants into the market, and they did try to hedge against wholesale price uncertainty. Um, but the lines of credit, don't forget, you have to buy your gas in advance if you do this. And eventually the, the wholesale, the, the, the finances of the company said enough is enough. We can't afford to keep lending money to hedge against gas prices. And that was really the end of Bulb. And they had a lot of customers, too big really for some other company to take them over. So the Treasury is now essentially um, ensuring their losses. And you know, this chart is quite interesting. This is domestic energy bills from 2019 through to the end of 2021. This is by tariff, standard variable tariff of the six largest suppliers. And the cheapest tariff, obviously, you get a good deal. But actually what happened was the smaller suppliers, if I just show you this chart, same chart, I've just added in two new lines. The orange line was the average standard tariff of the other suppliers, including some of the new kids on the block. And the cheaper tariff, again, of all suppliers. So what happened was a lot of these new suppliers came into the market offering very low prices, but you know, that wasn't sustainable as soon as the wholesale price of gas climbed to incredible heights. And that's why many of these firms have been going bust. In our next video, we'll just spend a few minutes looking at how the government might respond to this or has been responding to the energy price crisis and the possible consequences for living standards and also for inflation and other macroeconomic variables. Hope you found this useful. The energy market is hugely important. It's a very favourite topic of examiners. It's one, if you know something about it, you'll be in great shape for the exams. Thanks for staying with us. Stay curious, stay focused, stay safe, and see you sometime soon.